Happy Friday, ladies and gentlemen. I got the blues. I got the blues. I got the blues. I got the blues. Ugh, so boring, so predictable, and blah. I got the blues. I got the blues. Uh, well, that's too unpredictable. I have no idea what's happening in that piece of music. That no boy no. I got the blues. Every day I have the blues. I got the blues. Every day I have the blues. Do do do. But I got the blues. Yeah. And this one was just right. It's the musical Goldilocks zone. Amazing, the first piece was too simple to be musically satisfying, the second too complex, and the third was this perfect balance of parts that were predictable and parts that were not predictable. That grouping of chords and the melodic content that went with the chords is called the 12 bar blues, a specific musical form. While I could break down the individual harmonic, melodic, and rhythmic content of the 12 bar blues, that's not what we initially hear. When we listen to music, we take in large chunks of sound, a combination of musical elements. When we compare these whole chunks of music next to each other, we are analyzing form, the organization of all the elements of music. <laughs> Back in 1954, Leonard Meyer drew upon the gestalt principles of psychology gestalt, and thought about how, as a listener, we generally group music together as a whole. It's only through education and understanding and repetition that we were able to analyze and understand the smaller elements of music. Building upon the ideas of gestalt, gestalt Meyer created a theory of expectations for music. Based upon these large chunks of music, we can appreciate music as long as it falls within our expectations of what music should do. That being said, Meyer said that to appease our expectations would not be enough. Every once in a while, in order to stay intriguing, the music must violate our expectations. Leonard Meyer's theory of expectations was a dynamic way of explaining unity versus variety in musical form. Unity is exactly what it sounds like. In some way, the music is unified. A repetition of an idea. Unity is the throwback Thursday of musical form. In some way, we hear again what we've already heard. The work of Steve Reich and many other minimalist composers take this to extremes. In this selection from Music for 18 Musicians, everyone plays the same rhythm, the same notes, for quite some time. But at some point, that becomes too static, and eventually, the music changes. The music has variety. In many ways, a lot of the music in the hip-hop world plays on the idea of variety, but limits it to the rhythmic element. Paper Planes by M.I.A. is a great example of this. The harmonies are static, the melodic ideas are static. Only the lyrics and the added rhythms and the added timbral sounds created from a drum machine give the variety that is needed to keep the listener's attention. A large amount of unity, but there must be some variety to keep the listener engaged. Sometimes the unity and variety falls into distinct chunks, which can be labeled into a specific musical form. The first sets of forms are simple. So simple that after one listening, you could likely label the music yourself, should you hear those kinds of examples. We begin with strophic. A song in strophic form is a repetition of an entire melody, as is. That's it. Hymns are a common example of strophic form. They sing a whole song, and then repeat it, likely with a different set of lyrics. The only variety in strophic form is the lyrics. But some songs have two clearly defined sections, the first section and the second section. In music, we might call this first part the A section. The second section, which seems to be a complete contrast from the first section, would need to be something other than A. Perhaps B? In Yankee Doodle, this would be the A section. And this would be the B section. Sometimes in a binary form, the song would repeat the A at the beginning and the B at the end. A, A, B, B. But as long as the song is in some variation of A, B, it's in binary form. Other songs start and end with the same music but have a different section in the middle. This kind of music is the Oreo of the musical world and is incredibly popular. Mmm, dislike Oreos. This kind of form called ternary, we begin with an A, 
then move to a new set of music, B, and then return to what we began with at the beginning of the song, A. A, B, A. Ternary. That being said, ternary is not just limited to A, B, A. It could be A, B, A, B, A, or A, B, A, B, A, B, A. Ternary is the idea that you start one place, move away, and then return. Many pop songs are in ternary form. The song you've been listening to, Three Little Birds, is a great example of that. The part that starts with Don't Worry is the A, and Rise Up This Morning is the B. But Don't Worry, the song will always come back to Don't Worry About a Thing. Strophic, binary, and ternary are pretty darn simple, but musical forms can get much more complex. Rondo form, a favorite among music teachers, is sort of like a complex version of ternary. We will always still return to A, but in between each repetition of A, we have a new section. If we gave it, gave it a labeling, it would look like this. This famous piece, Rondo alla Turca, is a great example of Rondo form. In between each new section is this A section. Sing it with me now! Theme and variation is one of my favorite kinds of form. In some ways, theme and variation is like a strophic form in that we keep having a repetition of A. But in each repetition, something changes. It's recognizable as the first section, but with noticeable changes. This is another work by Mozart which has 12 variations on what we in America would call Twinkle Twinkle. It has other names in other countries. Each variation is unique from the others. And the changes happen in various musical elements. But each time, it's still recognizable as the original melody. Thus is the nature of theme and variation. Sonata form is the last of these complex forms. In some ways, sonata form is like an expansion of ternary form like Rondo. But instead of calling it ABA, I'm going to give each specific part a specific name. The first A I would call exposition, the middle B would be development, and the final A would be recapitulation. recapitulation. In front of the exposition, I'm going to add a new idea, the introduction. The introduction sets up the whole work. Finally, after the recapitulation, we have a coda. Coda means tail, and in music, it signifies the end of a work. Usually, the coda utilizes lots of different devices to make sure you understand the music is really coming to an end. Each of these sections in the sonata form could be further dissected, and truth be told, I could spend a whole video on the complex qualities of sonata form. Suffice to say, it's good enough to know that sonata form is like a complex version of ternary form. Sonata form is definitely a device of Western classical art music and is not heard in popular music much today. But in the classical period, sonata was king! This famous work, also by freaking Mozart, is a great example of sonata form. But sometimes works of music are grouped together in even larger chunks. You know that an opera is a lot of pieces of music, but together they create one opera. These kinds of forms are multi-movement works. The most famous of the multi-movement works are symphonies. Symphonies are made up of four movements. Movements are individual works that could stand alone. You could play them alone at a concert and no one would bat an eye. But they were composed with the intention of being played together. In traditional classical symphonies, each of the four movements has a particular role. The first movement is upbeat at a tempo marking called allegro, which is usually between 120 and 60 beats per measure. It is quite fast, and often the first movement utilizes sonata form. The second movement is much slower by contrast. Many times, it's in ternary form. The third movement is usually in triple and at a moderate pace. And like the second movement is also in ternary form. The fourth movement is the return to the faster pace. Often, the fourth movement is even faster than the first. This is meant to give the audience the cue that we are reaching the finish line to all four movements of the symphony. These are, of course, the traditional guidelines for the symphony. Not every symphony absolutely follows these guidelines. For example, this work we've been listening to is called the Gaelic Symphony by Amy Beach. Composed in 1894, unlike the traditional symphony structure, her third movement is not in triple, and many of her movements do not follow the traditional forms. But Beach's symphony does have four distinct movements and starts and ends with very fast tempos. As an audience member, one of the things that's interesting about symphonies and other multi-movement works is you're not supposed to clap in between the movements. You'll notice there's a silent moment between each movement where the conductor and his or her musicians are moving between each work without receiving applause. It's a funny thing about Western classical concerts, but it's done because the composer wants you to experience this music as a whole before disturbing it with an applause break. Unity versus variety, simple forms, complex forms, and multi-movement works. All of these concepts function as part of form, the final element of music. This is the end of the Music Element series, but next year we will be digging deeper and looking at some of the fundamentals of music theory. But for now, a haiku. 
it is the big chunks that we hear that turn into musical form. Now it's your turn. Click on one of these videos and see if you can figure out which part of musical form I am showcasing.